a taste for the ancient, a desire to learn about the history of our predecessors, has always enlivened people's minds. The ancient Greeks and Romans also loved to study their forefathers. Their attention was focused on the cultures and cities of the second and third millennia BC. Among the ancient civilizations of interest to Greek and Roman historians were the Egyptians along the Nile, the Assyrians and Babylonians on the Tigris and Euphrates, and the pre-Hellenic societies of Greece, the Minoans on the island of Crete, and the Mycenaeans in the Peloponnesus who inherited their power. The mystery and allure of Egypt was always a strong attraction. The age of the pharaohs had long faded by the second century BC, but the traces of that glorious past were still to be found everywhere. Inscriptions carved into the columns of temples told of grand deeds. Historians were fascinated with the story of the great Egyptian pharaoh Thutmose III, inscribed into the columns of the temple at Karnak. Thutmose had organized a great military campaign to conquer the Near East in the 15th century BC. When Thutmose reached those lands, however, he found that many of the very ancient Babylonian cities on the Tigris and the Euphrates had already been reduced to majestic ruins steeped in history. Of those ghost cities, one in particular has had an irresistible allure for historians, Ibla. Ibla was a legendary Assyrian city north of the Euphrates and the capital of an important ancient kingdom. But the ensuing centuries buried the ruins in sand, erasing all traces of the settlement from human memory. Apart from the inscription at Karnak, all that had remained of Ibla was a citation in the Bible. One day, some farmers were out plowing their fields when they came across a magnificent bas-relief. The news attracted an Italian archaeological team who unearthed pottery, elaborate utensils, and the torso of a statue bearing a votive inscription that clearly specified the name of the city. Ibla had been restored to existence. But the most sensational discovery came in 1975 when the Italian team unearthed 17,000 tablets bearing cuneiform text dating back to 2300 BC. Once translated, they were discovered to be commercial treaties and administrative and legal documents. Paradoxically, that immense treasure was preserved through the millennia thanks to a violent act of destruction. Around 2300 BC, the city was attacked and razed to the ground by King Sargon of Akkad. The tablets had been stored neatly on shelves in the archives of the royal palace. The palace collapsed in such a way that the tablets were left stacked one atop another, a position which favored their preservation and allowed archaeologists to accurately reconstruct their content. Ibla was a flourishing commercial center in ancient Syria, and its king was a rich merchant. Commerce was so important to the king that caravans leaving for the Orient or for the Mediterranean were invited to lodge in the royal palace. These caravans were the genesis of the city's fortunes and kept its king in power. If they were headed west, the caravans would make their way to the sea. From there, ships would carry cargo to western lands and pick up trade goods for the return journey.
Some of the goods that traded hands included fine pottery and art, but also much needed metals for weapons and armor. Sailing the Mediterranean at that time, however, was a great risk. Whoever had the biggest ship controlled the seas. And for a long time, it was a population known for acts of piracy who dominated the Mediterranean, the Mycenaeans. Between Mycenaean Greece and the Orient, there was a city that preyed on ships traveling along the Hellespont toward the Black Sea, the legendary Troy. The Mycenaeans fought a war against this city that has captured the imagination of historians and generations of students. Troy, once known as Ilios or Ilion, was a flourishing Hellenistic city. It was also one of the greatest mysteries challenging archaeologists. Many dedicated long years of their lives searching for it, lured by the fabulous treasures it promised. But it was not easy to rouse the beautiful Helen, the brave Hector, or King Priam from their slumber. Troy, the city whose siege was described so eloquently in perhaps the world's most famous book, Homer's Iliad, could have been anywhere. In 1868, a dilettante German archaeologist, Heinrich Schliemann, decided to invest the money he had earned in the import-export business to pursue his lifelong dream, to discover the places where the heroes of his youth, the heroes of the Iliad, had fought. The Iliad was certainly not a scientific treatise. Before being committed to writing around the 5th century BC, it had been handed down through generations by way of oral tradition and referred to events that had happened hundreds of years earlier. Yet Schliemann decided to put his faith in the text. Many archaeologists were hunting for Troy and they looked for it on this hill known as Bunurbashi, in an area between the Turkish cities of Çanakkale and Izin. Schliemann, however, was not convinced by that location. He combed the Iliad in search of clues. Homer mentioned two rivers, the Scamander and the Simoenta. The battles among the Homeric heroes took place around a fortified citadel built on a natural rise. They may have been figments of the author's imagination, but Schliemann chose to believe them. This hill, Hisarlik, was quite similar to the Homeric description. It was here where Schliemann began digging, and in the end, it was here where he found Troy. Nine different cities, one built upon the ruins of another, emerged from the excavations. From the second layer, Schliemann discovered amazing treasures, cups and vases, weapons, golden jewelry and buttons. He thought he had found the treasure of Priam. We now know that these jewels did not belong to the Trojan king of the Iliad. Modern archaeology, a science based on rigorous analytical methods far removed from the intuition that guided Schliemann, has dated the objects to several centuries before the Battle of Troy, attributing them to a royal family from the third millennium BC. But for the German archaeologist, the findings were none other than the treasure of Priam. His belief was supported by the evidence of fire in the lair where he found it. And Homer had said that Troy was burned to the ground by the Mycenaeans, who entered the city after a 10-year siege thanks to the stratagem of the Trojan horse, which now stands in replica on the site. Schliemann thought that the Troy attacked by the Mycenaeans was the same fortified city he had excavated, laid out in this plan dating back to the third millennium BC. A city surrounded by walls barely 400 feet in diameter would hardly have stood up to 10 years of siege, 
nor been able to house Priam's court. According to recent studies by teams at the universities of Tubingen and Cincinnati, in the second millennium BC, the era of the Mycenaeans' conflict, Troy was encircled by these much more extensive defensive walls and probably grew even more toward the end of the first millennium BC. Relying on descriptions in the Iliad and taking into account recent archeological discoveries that have uncovered new portions of the ancient city, we can now relive the legendary Mycenaean siege of Homer's Troy. This is what the Mycenaean soldiers would have seen when they landed in force from the sea to challenge the city. The sight of menacing warships headed for Troy was probably not unusual for King Priam and his people. The nine layers that were found at this archaeological site correspond to nine different cities, bearing testimony to the cycles of destruction and rebuilding. We now know that Troy, in addition to being of strategic importance for control of seafaring traffic, was also the foremost producer in its time of finished and semi-finished objects in gold. And so it is no surprise that it attracted the attentions of nearby populations. Conquering Troy meant not only eliminating the taxes it imposed on merchant traffic toward the Black Sea and the Orient, but also the reward of a rich booty. And so it was essentially economic motives that drove the Mycenaeans into Homer's legendary war while Homer's account of the beautiful Helen and the courage of heroes like Achilles and Hector has richly imbued the event with drama and romanticism. Troy was an extremely wealthy city and appropriately defended, surrounded by massive walls extolled by Homer as being invincible. That's why, after 10 long years of a fruitless siege, the Mycenaeans were forced to come up with the expedient of the wooden horse. Troy was destroyed and rebuilt nine times, the last time during the Roman epoch. One of the grandest city plans was created by none other than Alexander the Great. The noble deeds of the Trojans against the Mycenaeans were so vivid in the young leader's mind that he made an offering of his armor to the goddess Athena who was venerated in Troy. In response, the Trojans presented Alexander with armor that they claimed was used during Homer's war. The historians Strabo and Plutarch both reported the anecdote that Alexander the Great always wore that armor into battle, considering it to be a sacred symbol. In the 1800s, it was believed that this fortified city was of medieval origin. So archaeologists never bothered to dig within its walls in search of evidence of ancient civilizations. However, the nature of the location and the massiveness of the walls attracted Schliemann's attention. He had crossed through this area on the Peloponnesus on the search for Troy and was quite struck by these enormous stacked masses located near modern-day Argos. His mind was flooded with the images of the myths of his childhood and the words of Homer, who made mention of only one Mycenaean city girded by walls, the legendary Tyrans, built by the giant Cyclops. Schliemann, inclined to live out the dreams of his youth, and to take seriously the contents of ancient books, refused to accept the idea that that gigantic fortress dated back only to the Middle Ages. Those rocks inspired in him legends and myths hailing from the dawn of time. And there was also the Greek historian Posenius who confirmed the Homeric accounts about the existence of tyrants. Posenius had even gone so far as to compare the grandeur of the fortifications of Tyrans 
to the pyramids of Egypt. So somewhere near Argos, there still had to be those Cyclopean walls. Such a grandiose monument could not have simply vanished into thin air. And once again, the excavations vindicated Schliemann. At the top of the citadel, the ruins of a marvelous palace were found, with frescoes in Minoan style dating back to the second millennium BC. It was the Fortress of Tyrants. And once again, a destructive war was the reason for the preservation of all that beauty. The upper floors of the palace, collapsing onto those below, had filled the frescoed rooms with debris. The fire set by the invaders then melted the bricks, creating a sort of shell that preserved the remains of the palace. But who were the powerful invaders, able to destroy such a powerful city, protected by these imposing walls? Historians discovered that the winners of this epic victory were the Dorians, a people from the north who settled in Greece after driving out the Mycenaeans. The secret of their power? Their weapons were made of iron, a material unknown to the Mycenaeans who fought with more brittle bronze weapons. The strength and audacity of Achilles' heirs availed them little. Their swords shattered as soon as they touched those of their enemies. One Mycenaean city stood out above all others, the city that gave its name to the great conquerors of Troy. It was called Mycenae, a city recorded by Homer as having an abundance of gold. Its monumental gate overlooked by two lions, still inspires awe. This was the realm of the great king, the leader of the legendary expedition that destroyed Troy, Agamemnon. The intrigue surrounding a legendary locale has always been a strong stimulus to archeologists. Where was the tomb of Agamemnon? Had he ever really existed? Had Mycenae's golden riches, recorded by Homer, been spared the ravages of time? Posenius, in his writings, said that Agamemnon's tomb lay within the walls of Mycenae. But the city was surrounded by two sets of walls, an external one that protected the dwellings, and an internal one to protect the royal citadel. The search carried out within the external walls proved vain until Schliemann arrived on the scene. The archaeologist sunk his shovel near the Lion Gate inside the royal citadel. And he dug until the ground had yielded, from a number of tombs, the glittering metal immortalized by Homer, 33 pounds of gold. Among the treasures was a series of marvelous golden funerary masks. This was a privilege certainly reserved for kings. And in the features of the most beautiful mask of all, Schliemann claimed to recognize Agamemnon, the great king and military leader. Archaeologists have since discovered that those treasures date back to a period prior to Agamemnon. The excitement of that find was so great, however, that no one has since dared to rename this one-of-a-kind piece. The finely chiseled golden mask is still known to all as the Mask of Agamemnon. Schliemann had reached the heart of the Mycenaean civilization, the legendary home of its great king. And of course, a great king needs a great palace. 
Entering these rooms, recreated here according to Homer's description, we can see what a profound influence the Mycenaean culture had on the Greeks. The Mycenaean civilization handed down its own image to posterity, partially through architecture. This room with the hearth in the center, called a megaron, the heart of the palace, became the model for the most typical of the Greek buildings, the temple. The king's house thus became the house of the gods. Mycenae was a city of which legends were made, as was Tyrans and the incomparable Troy. The legends and the mythic heroes that accompanied them would have remained only that, pure fiction, if not for modern-day heroes like Heinrich Schliemann, men who follow their passions, pursuing a knowledge of humanity that enriches us all. We lay bare the paths of civilizations of heroes that came before, for a better understanding of the possible hero who sleeps within us all. The Mediterranean Sea, 5th century BC, a great commercial network created by the Phoenicians. In hundreds of archaeological sites scattered around the Mediterranean, objects are often found that are completely extraneous to local civilizations and cultures. An Egyptian amulet in Greece, a Greek vase in Africa, a huge multitude of goods moving from one country to another and another had to be transported and traded in some sort of systematic way. And it is the Phoenicians with their tall headdresses, their formidable ships, their skills in trading and their courage on the high seas who made a name for themselves in this pursuit. We'll see how the Phoenicians took on a diverse civilization of cultures and wove them together to become the undisputed lords of the sea. The Phoenicians originally came from what is modern-day Lebanon. They were organized into city-states, the most important of which was Tyre, whose magnificent Roman ruins are still standing. The easiest way for Phoenicians to increase their prosperity was by contact with other peoples, and the quickest route to new lands and cultures was the Mediterranean. They soon became outstanding sailors and astute traders, indeed the very best. They learned to recognize products that people wanted to acquire and those they wanted to trade. And they started sailing and trading as far back as the second millennium BC. To support their trade, they set up ports and founded colonies, built warehouses, and created a network of routes that touched on neighboring countries such as Egypt, Greece, the Magna Graecia, and Carthage in North Africa. Then they went on to reach Sardinia, the Mediterranean and Atlantic coasts of Spain, and farther south, along the coast as far as Senegal, and north to England and Ireland. A network of this size with hundreds of colonies and thousands of ships had to be well coordinated. For years, scholars speculated as to how the Phoenicians were able to communicate with each other in those remote times to organize warehouses and trade in such a variety of goods. It was the discovery of this sarcophagus of the Phoenician king Ahiram,
which dates back to the 13th century BC, that enabled archaeologists to understand the reasons for such great organizational skills. Engraved on the sarcophagus is the most ancient example of writing in alphabet form. It is composed of letters and not hieroglyphics. The Phoenicians were the first to invent an alphabet, a factor that proved indispensable in establishing their great trading network. We can get an idea of how extraordinary this innovation was from this comparison. On the right, we see two Egyptian hieroglyphics, and on the left, two letters from the Phoenician alphabet, an M and an H. By assembling these letters, the reader now didn't have to interpret a concept represented by a hieroglyphic or picture. He had a specific code that always remained the same and had the same meaning for whomever was reading it. The commanders of the Phoenician fleets had to have many skills. They not only needed expert knowledge of the sea and foreign lands, but they had to know the art of trading as well, what to buy, what to sell. One precious cargo of theirs was the mythical Cedar of Lebanon, an excellent timber for building sturdy cargo vessels and warships. The timber could be bought in Baalbek, situated in the mountains that formed a backdrop to the Phoenician cities in Lebanon. In the Hellenistic period, the city of Baalbek was known as Heliopolis, City of the Sun. By studying the meaning of these swastikas and other evidence, such as the different colors of columns at this site, archaeologists discovered that the enormous temple that dominated the city was dedicated to the sun god after which the city was named. But why were the columns painted in different colors? The mystery can be solved when the columns are linked to the cardinal points. The dark columns were placed to the west while the lighter colored columns were set to the east. They were supposed to represent life and death, the rising and setting of the sun. In 60 AD, the cella of the sun god was the most important construction in the entire sacred area, with 54 columns over 60 feet high, more than six feet in diameter. Having loaded the trunks of cedar wood onto carts, the traders would return to the coast where their ships awaited them. In the Bible, Ezekiel mentions that the Phoenician city of Byblus, which also lies in Lebanon, was the biggest naval shipyard in ancient times. Crossing the seas was not an easy matter, even with a good ship. This was one of the reasons why help from the gods was sought throughout the Mediterranean. These precious bronze statues covered in gold leaf have a strange headdress. It is a libad, which is typical of the Phoenicians. The statues have been found in great quantities in Byblus. They were votive objects used to invoke the favor of the gods. They were found at one of the most important places of worship for the Phoenician religion, the Temple of the Obelisks. In Byblus and other Phoenician cities, the remains of numerous Phoenician cargo ships have been found. The typical ship was 65 feet long and over 16 feet wide, large enough to carry a great deal of the precious cedar, as well as luxurious fabrics dyed with a reddish-purple pigment known as murex. The Phoenicians took their name from these fabrics. Phoenix, Phoenician, comes from the Greek word foin or red. This precious cargo could have been exchanged in any port. But a wise fleet's commander might seek out a product that could be worth its weight in gold, a kouros. A kouros is an exemplary model of harmony and proportion in the male body. Many of these statues, dating from the Archaic period, were discovered on the island of Rhodes near Comoros. Excavations nearby unearthed these celebrated vases, which are known as the Vases of Ficillura. This concentration of arts and craftsmanship on this island can be explained by the fact that roads lay at the hub of important trading routes.
To break up the long sea journeys, the ships sailed from island to island, and Rhodes was an obligatory port of call. Here is the dry dock or coffin of the colony which has been preserved intact for millennia. Here the Greeks were offered the fabrics and cedar for their ships. In return, the Phoenicians were given exquisitely decorated pottery and objects from all over Greece, including beautiful Greek statues like this one, as well as bronzes produced in the Magna Graecia, which may have been ordered by a rich Phoenician resident in a distant colony. Statues like this ephebe in bronze, or the famous Youth of Mothia, were found during excavations in the ancient Phoenician colony of Mothia in Sicily. The statues testify to the level of Phoenician trading in the Mediterranean, a veritable cross-cultural exchange. The ship, now loaded with vases, statues, and jewels, continues its journey to the west. It sails past the Pillars of Hercules at the Isthmus of Gibraltar and heads south along the Atlantic beaches of Africa between Morocco and Guinea. The Phoenicians were the only people brave enough to venture into the Atlantic. Ancient peoples were terrified of passing the Pillars of Hercules because they believed that beyond lay the end of the world. What was it that pushed the Phoenicians so far? The Greek historian Herodotus documented it in his writings. It was gold. The Phoenicians unload the merchandise and lay it out on the shore. Then they go back on board their ships and send up smoke. The locals see the smoke and place the gold that they are offering in exchange beside the merchandise. Then they withdraw. The Phoenicians descend from their ships and examine it. If they calculate that the quantity of gold corresponds to the value of their merchandise, they take it and leave. Otherwise, they go back to their ships and wait until they are satisfied. The African peoples were very taken with the showy Eastern goods and quite indifferent to the yellow metal that was found in such abundance there. This was the great bargain for the Phoenicians, leaving inexpensive pottery and jewelry and setting off again with gold. The ship would now head north. Excavations in England and Ireland have revealed that the Phoenicians reached even these far-off lands. Numerous finds have indicated that in exchange for pottery and jewelry, the northern peoples gave tin, a metal that was in great demand for producing bronze and the other alloys used by the Phoenicians and Greeks. Ireland was the most northerly landing point for Phoenician voyages, and having traded their goods, the sailors could now make the return journey. The trips always held the portent of danger. In the storms of the North Atlantic, the brave commanders would safeguard their ships and cargoes by tying themselves to the bow so that they could see more clearly and avoid the cliffs. It was from there that they gave instructions to the crew. If they were lucky enough to make it through, they would head south to the Phoenician colony of Cadiz. Here the Phoenicians bought iron and paid for it with gold. Then they traveled on to Majorca and from there to the rich colonies of Sardinia. It's here that an archeological dig uncovered a gold mine, not a seam or a stratum of gold, but a huge array of precious gold jewelry now on display in the Archaeological Museum in Cagliari. Since Sardinia has never had gold deposits, the precious metal must have come from Africa on Phoenician ships. In the Sardinian colonies, the Phoenicians themselves worked the gold into the most exclusive forms, modeling it in small molds. Sardinia was the largest producer of Phoenician crafts, especially in the field of glassmaking. They made ointment jars to hold bombs and perfumes, necklaces, and characteristic amulets. For centuries, it was believed the Phoenicians invented glass. While science no longer holds with this theory, 
they definitely were peerless masters in the field of glassmaking. For many years, archaeologists pondered the reason for the ambiguous smile on grinning masks like this one. They also didn't know the reason for the long arms on certain statues. Only after years of research did they find the answers. The masks were used to ward off evil spirits from the tombs. As for the statues, they were related to the more esoteric aspects of Phoenician medicine. They were offered to the gods to invoke a speedy recovery from illness. The affliction to be cured was in the exact spot touched by the hands, almost as if the sick person wanted to remind the gods what needed to be healed. Walls and the sea. A combination like this generally implies that we are dealing with a Phoenician emporium or a trading center. The archaeological site of Theros in Sardinia may not have any large architectural structures still standing, but it is one of the most eloquent when it comes to ancient urban design. Here, Phoenicians would have traded the iron, lead, and part of the tin and gold they had for precious jewels. Theros was one of the largest producers of jewelry of the period. Among the many Phoenician remains here is a completely extraneous round construction called a nurage that was typical of the Pelites, the ancient inhabitants of Sardinia who were conquered by the Phoenicians. This is how the village would have looked about 3,000 years ago. The Nuragic civilization is very ancient, dating back to the second millennium BC. Their settlements were very compact, with narrow winding streets which made it easier to defend the village from enemy incursions. The houses of the ancient Sardinian people were a combination of fortified towers, granaries, workshops, and dwelling places. There was no distinction made between the function of the various constructions. There was only the nurage, a unit where productive and family activities were carried out around a fire, the main focus of the house. But what exactly does the word nurage mean? It seems to come from the way their dwelling was constructed. In the ancient local language, nur meant mound, as we can see, the walls of the constructions are thicker than the dwelling area. They were built with heavy stones heaped on top of each other without the use of mortar. The constructions reached heights of more than 65 feet without using any lime. And they are indeed mound-like. Phoenician ports, like this one in Nora, all had something in common. They were situated near promontories. In this way, ships could be moored on both sides of the promontories, creating a larger dock area. The only thing the Phoenicians looked for was to be able to land quickly, get their business done, and then set sail again. These are the foundations of the Phoenician quarter in Nora. Although it's worlds away from the Romans' concept of living, with the Romans preferring large orderly quarters equipped with many services and amenities, the Phoenicians did share the Romans' love of thermal baths. The baths here in Nora are decorated with rich mosaics. The theater here is also quite spectacular, dating from the second century AD it is one of the most fascinating monuments in all of Sardinia. From this Spartan 5th century Phoenician port, the fleet would have set sail again, now laden down with even more jewels and precious objects. One of the greatest archaeological mysteries regarded the port of Carthage, queen of the Mediterranean, the most powerful of all Phoenician colonies. The Greek historian Appian, a native of Alexandria in Egypt, 
tells us that the port had two harbors, the rectangular commercial port and the round military harbor with an island in the center. However, in modern times, no place seemed to correspond to that description until in the 19th century, the writer René Chateaubriand noticed these two lagoons near the bay of Le Cram were very similar in shape to the ports mentioned. He realized that this was Carthage. This discovery led to a heated debate, which was only concluded with excavations carried out in 1974. A British team, excavating on the circular island, found evidence that confirmed Chateaubriand's theory. The bustling port of Carthage was the largest and most modern port in pre-Roman times. Warships would pass from the commercial port through a narrow passage to the military harbor. Merchant ships were forbidden to pass beyond this limit. The ship that is entering the port is a trireme with three tiers of rowers. Though the Carthaginians also had quadriremes and quinquiremes, which can be compared to modern day battleships. All the ships returning from war missions, by which Carthage dominated the Mediterranean and protected Phoenician trading routes, were moored in this port. It was circular, with a round island in the center, known as the Island of the Admiralty. There were dry docks both on the island and in the outer perimeter of the port. On the summit of the island was the Pavilion of the Admiralty, from which the supreme commander of the fleet gave military orders. A bugler and a herald, armed with flags, controlled the traffic of ships in the port. If a trumpeter signaled to turn left, there had to be room enough to make the maneuver. The basin of water in which the ships moved was thus over 300 feet wide, the same diameter as the island of the Admiralty on our right. There were 30 berths in the center and 140 on the outside. Since some of the very deep central moorings could hold two ships, there could have been 200 ships in the port at one time. The military port in Carthage was always packed in winter, since bad weather made it dangerous for the ships to be out on rough seas. Thus, there was a tendency to avoid war during this time and this was a good time to service the ships. The trireme would be pulled up onto dry land over the slightly sloping terrain of the island. Planks of wood set crossways ensured that the ships kept their grip on the slipway. At the entrance to the area, ionic columns set at sea level gave the impression of a portico to make this military site look more elegant. The ships were also given special aesthetic treatment. Phoenician ships typically had an eye painted on the bow that was supposed to strike fear into their enemies. A warship differed from a cargo ship in that it had oars and oarsmen that enabled it to move very quickly. As well as being outstanding sailors, the Phoenicians excelled at shipbuilding. They mass-produced ships and replaced the vessels sunk by their enemies with great speed. All the parts of the ship were clearly marked by different letters and kept ready for quick assembly. In this way, they could build an entire fleet in a short period of time. The busy commercial part of Carthage, however, was the Bursa, the Acropolis of Carthage. This is where the major transactions, the trades and selling of jewelry and glasswork brought from Sardinia, would take place. These goods were in great demand in Carthage. On their way home, the ships might also sail up the Nile to the grand and mysterious kingdoms of the pharaohs. Despite the fact that Egyptians followed the cult of the hereafter, the royalty adored earthly treasures. The Phoenicians would have traded the jewelry from Tharos for linen, a hard-wearing fabric that only the Egyptians knew how to make. This material was indispensable for the robust sails used on Phoenician ships. They might also have purchased rare and exotic goods greatly sought after at the Persian court 
namely monkeys and crocodiles. Finally, completing the loop and reaching the town of Tyre, they could sell the exotic animals to the Persians and the linen to their fellow countrymen. They'd be left with gold, silver, and a lot more money than they would have paid for the cedar back in Baalbek. Through their travels and their trading, their ancient wheeling and dealing, the Phoenicians formed links with most of the known world at that time, enabling a variety of peoples to share the best that distant cultures had to offer. The Phoenicians, undisputedly, the master merchants of the Mediterranean. <laughs>